On the Sydney Futures Exchange, the sky finished up 25 at 2,557. We're doing something like ten and a half trillion dollars worth of business a year in nominal terms, which means on average, two hundred billion dollars a day trades on the SFE. This is where all the orders come down through all the way from all around the world, come down to the Sydney Futures Exchange and they use an open outcry so you'll bid all your offer them and then people will trade, you know, they'll buy and sell. You are speculating on whether each rates on a hourly, daily, minute basis is going to go up or down. You're bullish if you think the price is going to go up and you're bearish if you think the price is going to go down. And that extends to things being good versus things being bad. Here we go. Well, the buzz of trading is it's instant gratification. You can make a lot of money very quickly. Let's throw the dice and we'll put our money on the table and set. it's just like one big casino out there. The futures market's a place where risk is transferred from someone who do doesn't want the risk to someone who's prepared to accept the risk. And that's about it. Buy Buy 200. Buy 300. Buy everything you can fucking get your hands on. I don't try to predict where the market's going to go. It's 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 like it's it's like a it's like a comet going going through in the sky. You can't see the comet, but you can see the tail. We can see the price action, but we can't actually ever really grasp the market. You can't really ever really grasp the market. All you can do is try to jump on board the comet and ride it for a while. All we can see is the tail. That's the price action. It's historical prices. People, you can analyze charts up the yin yang. You're looking at the tail of the comet. You got to learn to get aboard the comet and ride the comet. That's the idea of, of, of trading. It's the idea of getting on board the market and, and doing what the market tells you to do. It's a very hard thing to do. I would say only two or three times a year I really feel like I'm on board the comet. But when I'm aboard the comet, it's the best feeling in the world. <laughs> well, his name's John. He's American. And uh, he's a big trader, a very big trader. Um, so. He came into the pit and he was like, with a very strong American accent. Somebody said, it's not your war, John. He goes, it is now. So they call him Rambo. I remember well, the first time I walked onto the futures floor of the Chicago Board of Trade. I was in college and was taking a, a course in investments. I knew from the second I walked on that floor, electricity went through me. My skin tingled and I said, this is my destiny. I mean, I just knew it straight away. Futures trading isn't for the weak-hearted, and it's certainly not for everybody. When people come to me and, and that, that know me that, and, that, and know what I do, and they say, "Well, John, I've got an extra ten thousand dollars. Can you know? Can you can you do something with it for me?" I go, "No, there's absolutely nothing I can do with it for you. You know, I, I trade my own money only. That's all. I, I mean, I have you know, I have enough problems doing that. You know, more. You know, God forbid, I took your ten thousand dollars and lost it in a couple hours. I mean, you'd, you'd kill me." I think, you know, the reason the market's very anxious is that they're worried about the fact that Japan uh, weakness will lead to China being forced eventually to devalue the yuan. Uh, and then people are saying if that were to happen, that could destabilize the rest of Asia and, and also uh, maybe uh, put some pressure on Latin America as well. So there's sort of a house of cards uh, that people are starting worrying about coming apart again. All right. See you, John. Thanks for the ride in. See you tomorrow. Oh. Well, here we go. It's another day. Brokers, in many respects, are like taxi drivers. Well, at least I did the dishes last night, a part of them. We're here to take someone from A to B and from, and from B back to A. Turn the lights on for the day. Morning, all. You can't be too opinionated because it's the traders who are opening the risk and, and they're the people who, who really want to, to make the cold decision whether to, to buy or sell. We're here to provide information to support them in the decision-making process. 
Half of the all, in with the new. The great thing about broking is, whether they make money or lose money, you're going to get paid for the transaction. The only way you can not make money broking is not do any business. So you got to get inside the customer's head, and you got to, you know, provide them with a service that they that they need. Become part of their daily life. That they have to talk to you every day, or they can't do what they want to do. I mean, everybody reads the papers, but if I can find a couple of articles that capture a feeling, then I'll send it out in the package. The Australian dollar friendless and local currency markets more volatile than any time since the Banana Republic days. The effects of the crisis in Asia will almost certainly damp or dampen net exports. That'll do. Okie dokie. This will wake him up. Ten past seven. That's the lower aisles. And uh, you can snorkel out there. There's a beach out there, lighthouse. It's a uh, national park, so you can, you know. Not a lot, lot, not a lot to fish around it. I know that. Hello. Hi, John. The bond rallied from about one o'clock. I've sent you a two-minute tick chart. Should be on your machine. Okay, bet. Um, yeah, bills, please. The bills yeah. have all improved yeah. substantially. Yeah. I'm fairly, con fairly convinced I'll trade up to fifty. Uh, maybe even 60. All right, so me 250 uh, set bills at 14. OCO marches at 95. But there we go. I'm back to work. John uh, Moulton resides primarily in far north Queensland, um, and I would think that he spends now only about 5% of his trading days on the trading floor. And I'm sure that when you've spoken to him, he's he's been able to elaborate how he can how he can trade just as successfully off the trading floor as he can trade on the trading floor. My fucking computer doesn't want to stay on. Nobody fucking loves it. Oh no wonder. My fucking this is this is great. My phone lines are fucked. Telstra and its in its wisdom came out the other day and, and put in a temporary phone line. They have no idea this this could cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's being fucked up the way it is. Anyway, what are you gonna do? It's an omen. It's an omen to sit on my hands this morning and not trade, maybe. Aha. I know all I gotta do is this. Get the new phone line in. There. Put that in there. Voila. Clear line. Beautiful. <laughs> little alternative thinking works here. You know what the real sad part is, is this telephone is only gonna is only gonna wanna work out there. It doesn't want work right here. If I move five feet that way, the fucking thing works. I'm gonna, I need to call directly to the floor. <clears throat> Can you put me through to Axel for just for a second? Are there any spread orders in the pit I should know about right now? Is it still bid there? All right, listen, could you call me up with this stuff before it goes out of the pit? I mean, you're telling me stuff that's already happened. It doesn't do me a whole lot of good. I would love to have sold that at 30 points. I was buying the bills and selling the three years last night, and this is, that, would be, that would have been a good opportunity to liquidate it. No, just as soon as, as soon as anything hits that pit, can you call me straight away with it, please? Thank you, mate. By the time he calls me and tells me what's going on, the, the trade has already occurred and gone, and there's not much I can do about it. So, you know, the floor is still got, you know, the floor has still got a, heaps of advantages. My profitability would be a lot higher if, if I was still on the floor. So there you go. 
There are about 450 people on the trading floor. 300 of them work for the brokers, the banks, the institutions. And then there's about 150 or locals trading their own money. Those locals trading their own money make or lose the way they trade. They buy it, they make money. If it goes up, they sell it, they make money if it goes down. As far as a pit trader goes, you have to be quick, aggressive, loud. I, I sort of establish what's going on in the pit and, you know, when traders get orders, try to panic them more into, into making trades that they don't really want to make or that they have to make in order to fill the order. You can lose a lot of money very quickly because it, it is a very risky business. If you're a trader that's trading large volume, making money, then all of a sudden it dries up and you're still trading large, you'll find yourself in, in trouble. By the way, this is what I traded yesterday. You want, to, you want to see it in the written form? There you go. I traded, um, I think I figured out it was 18,000 lots yesterday, which for me is sitting up here in Port Douglas has got to be certainly a record about 13% of the market, which um, is probably larger than it should be. I'm not comfortable trading that large um, size with the market and the overall volume of the market. It's usually not a good sign. It can be a sign that I might be over trading. Off to Saicom we go. Actually, 88. Ten years starting off with that six and a half bid. We open. You can go crazy in this weather. It keeps raining. Really, your day your day never really has a start, and your day really doesn't have an end. I look at it more along the lines of when is the market shut and when is the market not shut? And pretty much nowadays the market is open I'll from, you know, 8.30 on Monday morning till 6 o'clock Saturday morning. My perception is, is, is that the nature of the market is, is, is constantly evolving. Um, so do you as a trader um, constantly have to evolve with the market. And the best way to do that is to just uh, literally, I just have to just really stare at it very hard. Just really stare at it really hard, you know? I just stare at it. And then it'll come to me. When I was trading my own account, I dreamt about the market and trading, and I, I, I had my first winning trade in a dream two months after I stopped trading my own account. They were always losers. You know, you'd buy something and it'd go against you immediately and you panic attack, what do I do? Do I get out? Do I add to it? Uh, and those are the kind of dreams I, I was having. And now with 24 hour trading, I wouldn't, I, I don't know, I've got customers who call the SICOM desk, which is the overnight market, every hour, right through the night. I've sort of learned patterns that happen in the T-bonds that seem to repeat themselves, and that's what we're doing, is just looking at patterns that happened in the past that seem to have got it right more than wrong, and uh, setting them in the computer so if that pattern does occur again, to let us know. Hi, Larry, it's Van speaking here. How are you? Good. My strongest signal tomorrow it looks like, uh, I guess, what we call our oops if we open lower than today's low. Mm -hmm. My style of trading is all based on one trader, and that's Larry Williams. And uh, he is, in my opinion, the best trader in the world, and he's proved it many a time. When what should work doesn't work, you got great, valuable information, incredibly information. So I like what's happening down here. I see some bullish stuff. I'm looking, gee, I like those triangular formation or whatever. I want to get long two bars above. i got to be a buyer there. Notice what you have, though, our old friend, the outside bar, higher high, higher low, lower close. We want to be a buyer, the next bar. He turned 10000 into $1.1 million, and no one's ever got any close to it. He's the best trader in the world. I want to trade like he does. And so his approach is, yeah, he goes for five-mile run every day. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't drink very much. He has like a zen approach to the markets. He doesn't watch them all day. Want to have a bet? Are you betting now? Are you betting money? 
We're going to have a bet on something. You think it was a bet? I'll bet you it doesn't rain here while we're still sitting here and having lunch, and we're okay, going to be here for... How much are we betting? Five dollars. Okay, then. You're on. Shay. Okay, then. Don. What's, ah, what's your name, by the Julie. way? Julie. Julie, I'm John. John? Five dollar bet. Five dollar bet that it is going to rain while you are here. That's that's good bet. Okay, then. All right. I'm happy with that. <laughs> Uh-oh, it's starting to rain already. I'm funk stuffed. You know, what if I said five hundred dollars? What would she have done? So I'd say, "You're on. Yeah. Make it a <laughs> thousand. I'd be like, hey, "You're coming home with me. I want you to trade for me this afternoon." <laughs> Hello. Well, how are the deck bills? You getting? Can you do any positive? How are the threes and tens? It gets so compulsive and obsessive that you keep going in there and doing it. And if you're consistently making money, you sort of, <clears throat> in a way, you probably create these problems for yourself by, you know, you're winning, you're winning, you're winning. And you, you want, you know, you want to have that, a bigger trade or, or, or win bigger, you know, and that's when you usually start losing. Usually lunchtime he'll ring me, I can tell by his tone of voice. Say hello. <laughs> or, or we, are booked on a flight that afternoon. I know he's had a really bad day. And he'll sort of say, we're going to Bali at five o'clock, pack, pack the kids up. I've had a day where um, it's been, a, a, some economic data come out, has come out. I think it was an employment figure. And um, the data was bearish. So the market went to lunch at 12.30. Um, the bonds were, were weak, I think they're off 10. Anyhow, I got back from lunch and I looked up and uh, I think the Nikkei had taken a two, two or three percent dive. Two o'clock comes, I'm 200 short. The market opens up three or four points higher. And of course, I'm trying to protect my position and BT start buying. So I sell another 50 and it goes against me straight away, three or four points. I'm short 250 now and there are no sellers. It rallies three or four points, so I sell another 100. You know, not even taking into account the flight to quality, not even thinking, just thinking that these are too expensive. I'm 350 short now, and it's really starting to look a bit serious. It rallies another five points, and I sell another 150, so I'm 500 short. And at this stage, it's looking at about half a million dollars, and I'm just screaming out, sellers, sellers, give, you know, give me a seller. You know, I want a seller so I can get out. Sellers, sellers. No one knows what's going on with me, of course, because it's just mayhem in the pit. I could taste blood in my mouth, and I was just, my heart was beating. You know, I was looking at about $700,000. I was looking, I was thinking about my wife. My life was just flashing in front of me, seeing you out the house. Um, and I'm there screaming, sellers, sellers, sellers. And there's just, all of a sudden, the market just goes dead quiet. And there's just one guy, odd minute, just bidding for 200 at the high, going like 57 for 200, 57 for 200. And I'm going, if I have to pay any, you know, three points higher, it's going to cost me over a million dollars. That's going to be me out of the game. And all of a sudden, sellers came in, and sellers came in hard. And they, and and before I could buy them back, the market came off five points, came off another five points. I bought them back and took a took a half a million dollar loss. And I was just very happy to get out of a half a million dollar loss. I mean, I have to try and keep myself together as much as I'd like to kill him. Um, you can't. It just makes the situation worse. And, yeah. you know, he could lose everything. He's one of those traders that, yeah. you know, could end up with nothing. And I'm not prepared for that to happen. So it's just a matter of me sort of keeping it together and so, letting him go and do his thing. <laughs> President Yeltsin is preparing to quit, have sent a shiver through the world's markets that have even reached Wall Street, sending the Dow crashing more than 350 points. Too much confusion everywhere. We have a major meltdown in stocks in Japan. We have a serious problem with the stocks in the United States today. Bond markets are all over the map. Our coverage this morning begins with attempts by the Australian Reserve Bank to protect our dollar overnight in New York. Intervention which caused a temporary surge before the sellers moved back in for the kill. Um, oh, last couple of days, just crazy. Um, the dollar got nailed and our markets came off in, in response, so we had a couple of the biggest days the exchange has ever had. Um, you can hear my voice, I'm just so exhausted after that. 
started on in the middle of the night last Thursday night and it's just been uh, violent Aussie currency moves on the downside, obviously. Um, we were looking at a Mark was anticipating a half a percent interest rate easing. In fact, it looks like we could be having a full basis point up. Uh, I haven't heard any horror stories on the floor. Often with those sort of moves, you get some of the locals uh, get killed and, and go out of business, go bankrupt. I haven't heard any of those stories, which is, which is lucky. expected the bills to trade 100 points under cash, seeing as they'd been a premium to cash for so long. So um, I caught everybody out of it, including myself. I'm sure there's peop some people that did quite well that were, you know, and I'm normally a very bearish trader. I mean, I love the bear trade. I love being short. And yet we had the biggest bear move in years and I lost money. I prefer not to comment on how much money I lost. Let me put it this way, it was, it was, it was over a million dollars. So we're going the fastest way, right? Speed is of the essence, man. Well, Time is money. Of, yeah, 60, uh -huh. 60 along here is unfortunately. It's a problem with the police. They got their little unmarked cars running around here. <laughs> so what sort of work you do? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, right now I'm not doing much of any work. Hmm. I speculate on international interest rate futures. Okay. There you go. That's where the money is. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. That's... Heaps of money. Sure. <laughs> All going out right now. Yeah, but it's been like that for years. Sometimes it goes, sometimes it comes. Hey, it seems to, it seems to me you know a bit about the business, mate. Well, you learn a fair bit when you're in a taxi. Mate, it's, uh, I can smell the air. It smells dirty. Lots of car exhaust fumes. Lots of people milling around like a bunch of rats scurrying around, wondering what the fuck they should be doing with their lives. <laughs> it looks to me like. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just I mean, and That's another thing. I've come back to Sydney, and so my attitude changes. All of a sudden, I'm like this big asshole all of a sudden. This is like, this is pre-training pre for going back to that, that mongrel floor and having a go down there. Yeah, that's true. No, I don't. I love it. Oh, there we go. Oh, this is fun. This is fun. It's time to make some fucking money, that's for sure. And it's been such a difficult week, and it's going to be a few casualties, which is always a bit of a difficulty in our market. You know, whenever you get some massive movement like this, and the leverage and gearing that the futures market provides, there's going to be a few casualties. And the broker is the customer's friend, confidant.